Last week on money. Anybody else happy about that? <laughs> I'm happy about it. It'll be better for, for the people you bring. We're talking about the birth of Christ for the next uh, three Sundays as we lead up to the High Holy Day. <clears throat> How you doing today? They say preachers don't like to preach about money. We'd rather preach about hell because we know more about hell. <laughs> and because... We don't, it, it's just awkward for me to talk about money. I could go somewhere else preach about money, no problem. But because I receive a salary here, I, I don't get a percentage of the offering if you're curious about that. <laughs> Which is good. <laughs> because of that, there are all kinds of jokes. I'm going to tell you an old one. I, I heard about the, the hog farmer that called the church and the uh, administrative assistant answered the phone and he said, I'd like to talk to the head hog at the trough. And the secretary said, if you mean our senior minister, we would never speak so disrespectfully of him. He said, well, I'm sorry, I didn't mean any harm by it. He said, I just know you're in a building program, and I was wanting to make a $100,000 donation. She said, hold on a second, the big pig looks like he's walking in right now. <clears throat> Jesus did not need money, but he talked about it a lot anyway because he knew that where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The best thing you can do in your life is give your heart to Jesus. But for you to give your heart to Jesus, you also have to give your money to him. And the whole premise of the series is this. If Jesus is the king of your life, it affects the way you handle kingdom people, live by kingdom economics rather than by the economics of the world. And so we've said... Here's a little review for you, and it'll be real quick. Number one, God owns it all. I brought nothing into the world, and when I leave, I'll take nothing with me. It all belongs to him. It's on loan to me for a little while. Therefore, number two, I ought to be very thankful. It's all God's stuff. He gives me some of it. I, I should say thanks when he does. That makes sense. Three one, I should manage God's trust fund. God has given me a little bit of money to manage. It's his money. I manage it for him. And today, just do something about what you know. You're not going to stumble into being a good money manager. The Bible says this in Matthew 25. After the master gave the three different servants different amounts of money, he said, the man who received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gave five bags more. And here, I just want to push you today, best I can. I'm going to give you six practical biblical suggestions about your money, about God's money that you're in charge of. Okay, I almost slipped there. Did you see that? I'm going to give you six of these biblical, practical suggestions. Now, they won't all apply to everybody, but somebody will, you'll get something out of there, There'll be at least one or two of these for you. The first one is this. Do something to get out of financial bondage. A lot of Christians are in financial bondage. It's a, a great stressor in marriage. And I'm just going to tell you that making more money is not necessarily the answer to your financial problems. We used to think, well, if I just could make more money, I wouldn't. Let me show you a couple pictures. This is Lenny Dykstra. Uh, he was a good ball player, played for the New York Mets, and I think he played for the Phillies. He's, he made, in his career, $58 million, which I think I could, you know, if, if they gave me $58 bucks for whatever, I think I could, I could do okay. The next guy uh, is uh, that's Terrell Owens. He made $80 million playing professional football and being a clown. <laughs> you don't remember Terrell? Okay, here, here's the next picture. Uh, that's Antoine Walker. Uh, he made $100 million playing professional basketball. And the last picture is Mike Tyson, who paid a lot of money for that uh, facial work. <clears throat> he made, in his career, $400 million. Now, you know what all four of those guys have in common? They all declared bankruptcy after they quit playing. Isn't that crazy? You think, well, that wouldn't happen to me. Well, maybe not, but I I'm just telling you, the answer to our money problems is not always more money. The problem is we live in a pay Play now, pay later culture. Psalm, Proverbs 25, good planning, hard work lead to prosperity. Hasty shortcuts lead to poverty. And the shortcut is getting what I want now, and even though I can't afford it. I remember uh, being in Panama on a mission trip. Out, David is at the coast, 75 miles up the mountain. Beautiful, prettiest place I've ever been is Boquete, Panama. 
And at night we went out one night to a, a church meeting out way out in the country in the coffee plantations. And I remember driving out there. You talk about dark. Because when there's no electricity out there, it's just, it's, it's way dark. But I remember driving my little roadside stand where they sell Coca-Cola. Think of that. And seeing a guy in there waiting for people to stop by, and he's got the glow of a color television sitting there, run on a car battery. You know what I thought? I, how miserable for that guy to sit and watch rich people and think, how could they be that rich? I mean, and, and no, he could see all the stuff that people have and think, well, there's no way ever I could ever have any of that. You know what's worse? Is to live here, see it, and think, I can have it. I can have it now, even though I don't, can't afford it, because I have a credit card. Get out of financial bondage. It's a, a tough deal. Proverbs 22 says this. The rich rules over the poor. Their borrow becomes the lender's slave. A lot of people, <clears throat> Rick Etchett said, act like they're members of Congress, spending money we don't have. And we need to learn to act our wage. <laughs> Lifestyle of debt will keep you from doing things that God prompts you to do. W wouldn't it be great if you saw somebody with a need, you, you, I don't know what it is, like their car broken down or they whatever's going on in their life, and, and you just see this need, and you think, well, I just, I've got money, why don't I give it to them? But most of us see that need and go, well, I hope somebody with some money helps them. Because right now, I've got all these, you know, the payments are all due because the credit cards are coming up, and I've got to at least make some progress on that. The IRS, this isn't really happy news, is it? The IRS says the average tax filer pays 10 times more in interest than they give to charity. Now that's that's a, a wild statistic. So some of us need to do some plastic surgery with the credit cards. Stop living. <laughs> I'm not mad at you. Stop living like credit is your provider and act like God is your provider. I, I'm going to tell you a little secret. As long as you borrow money for it, nobody's going to give you any money for it. I, this is... I just think you need a little help, so I'm going to give you a little help, okay? I, I've had, in my lifetime, I think I've had three cars given to me. Well, how do you do that? Well, you don't borrow money to buy the next one. And people get tired of seeing you drive something that's not going to make it to town. And every once in a while, somebody says, here, why don't you have my car? <laughs> that worked three times. <laughs> you, you think I'm lying to you, but I'm not. I could tell you the cars and kind of the people who gave them to me. And it's because they thought, well, you know, <clears throat> but if you'll go out and borrow money for it, and nobody's going to help you. You can just make the payments on your own. You can wander into debt, but you're not likely to wander out. And so I would just encourage you, and, and I know this doesn't apply to everybody, because not every one of these uh, suggestions will apply to everybody, but if you're in a place where you're in financial bondage, would you admit it and ask for help? We have people in this church who could help you sort your finances out, would be glad to sit down with you and, and give you a plan I don't want to use the word budget because that's too harsh, but a way that you could make it and, and your life would, would be better. If you've never, if this is a problem for you, we do offer this Dave Ramsey class about once or twice a year. I understand Candy Kissel tells me the last three groups that have gone through that, during that, how long is that class? 13 weeks? Something like that? Eight weeks, 10 weeks? During that time, during those classes, those people have paid off $75,000 in credit card debt. That's amazing. Okay? But you're not going to do that accidentally. Okay? So I've lost friends. Let's go on. <clears throat> do something to protect your heart from greed. Why did Jesus talk about money so much? Because money has the potential to become your God substitute. It mimics God. It offers security, identity, significance. It can't provide. Okay, but it will tell you, you, you get money, you're going to have all the things you need. But you cannot serve both God and money. You'll give your heart and your allegiance to whatever you think is going to provide for you. Now, you, you filter that through. If you think God's going to be your provider, then you'll give your heart and allegiance to God. If you think money is going to be, you'll give your heart and allegiance to money. And that's why the Bible calls greed idolatry. First Timothy 6, love of money causes all kinds of evil. This is a great sermon right before Christmas, isn't it? <laughs> Love of money causes all kinds of evil. Some people have left the faith because they want to get more money, but they've caused themselves much sorrow. I don't really need more money or more faith. I need more faith rather than, than more money. You cannot always protect your assets. 
There are thieves and rust and moths, and they will destroy. That's what Matthew, Jesus said in Matthew 6. But I can protect my heart from greed. How, how can I protect my heart from greed? Well, let me just encourage you to saturate your mind with the Word of God. Because Jesus talks a lot about money. Just read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Read the Gospels. You read them over and over again. And as Jesus talks about money, it will saturate your heart and mind. It will change the way you think. And I'll give you one more suggestion how to get rid of the greed virus. Give money away. There, there is nothing more powerful, no better way to get over greed than to just give it away. Well, I don't think I could do it. That's because you're greedy. Really. And I, somebody gave me that challenge one time. I'm, I'm just telling you, you want to get rid of greed, you, you, have, you have to give. Here's a third suggestion. Do something to support the mission of your local church. Now, what I'm going to say right now, this is my opinion. Okay, it is my opinion First of all, everybody ought to be part of a local church if you're a Christian. Hello? Fair enough. And it's my opinion that you should tithe, because the Bible says it. And it's also my opinion you should tithe to your local church. You think, well, where did you get that? Well, the Old Testament, the Bible says the tithe belongs to the Lord. Okay? And in the Old Testament, you brought your tithe to the priest. It went right there. Okay? In Matthew, Malachi 3.10 says, bring the whole tithe to the storehouse. In Acts 4, when the they sold some property, they brought the money, they laid it at the apostles' feet to be used as they would choose. Take some faith to relinquish control of the money that you give. Now, the tithe belongs to God. I think you ought to give past that, and you can give that money wherever God leads you to do that. Now, I know as you, you're, you're hearing this, you think, well, the church has flaws. It absolutely has flaws. This church has flaws, but it, the church is the hope of the world. It's the church that Jesus said, by this church I will storm the gates of hell and hell will not advance against the kingdom of God. I believe that Jesus is the head of the church and he expects his body to support financially <clears throat> the place where, where we get fed. Now, anybody uncomfortable? I'm uncomfortable with all that. Because, uh, because I'm your preacher. If I, was in a, if I were somewhere else preaching this, I would lay it, I'd just lay it thick. But I'm uncomfortable doing that. So I just want to read a little Bible to you. You do this. 1 Corinthians 9, in the same way the Lord opened or ordered, it's an order from God, that those who preach the good news should be supported by those who benefit from it. Galatians 6, 6, those who are taught the word of God should provide for those teachers, sharing all good things with them. 1 Timothy 5, the elders who rule well are to be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. This is the church where you bring your kids that are back there right now being fed the word of God. It's where you're encouraged, trained, loved, supported, and cared for. And you don't have to give to this church to come here, but somebody gives so you can come. Salvation's free, ministry's expensive, and I need to learn to quit apologizing for asking God's people to support God's work here. I have an easy enough time asking you to support God's work over there, but it's hard for me to ask you to support God's work here. And the Bible teaches that those who are part of the ministry should support that ministry. 3 John 7 and 8, and we're not, not going to read it, but he says this, these people went out accepting nothing from the Gentiles, accepting nothing from those who were the target. They went out to, to take the gospel to them. Occasionally, I'm asked why I have a pretty rigid personal opinion and stance against the church doing fundraisers. I know a lot of churches do. I'm not saying anything bad about anybody, but personally, I hate it. And I'll tell you why. I don't want people in this community to think we're after their money. I want everybody in this town to know and love Jesus Christ and go to heaven. I, I, don't, I don't want their money. And if we go out asking them to support our mission trips and our, our stuff, I, they're gonna, I think they're going to feel like I feel about the school. <laughs> And I don't want that. I, I, I think it's up to us. So, so do something to support the ministry of your local church. Number four, do something based on the examples of others. You heard of prayer warriors, warriors. There are giving warriors as well. Now, I know in regard to giving, we usually practice this don't ask, don't tell kind of thing where nobody knows what anybody else gives. And, and honestly, I don't know what anybody gives and don't want to know. But in the Bible, they also... it extols those who gave great gifts. It, for instance, in Acts chapter 4, there was a man named Joseph who sold a piece of land, brought the money, laid it at the apostles' feet, and they said, well, we're going to call him Barnaby the Encourager. 
And they, they, they exalt this guy. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Let me just read a little here. I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, what God in his kindness has done through the churches of Macedonia. They're being tested in many troubles. They're very poor, but they're also filled with abundant joy, which is overflowed in rich generosity. He said, I want you to look at how, how these people gave. Maybe it will encourage you. I testify that they gave not what they could afford, but far more. And they did it out of their own free will. They begged us again and again for the privilege of sharing and the gift for the believers in Jerusalem. They even did more than we had hoped for. Uh, for their first action was to give themselves to the Lord and to us, just as God wanted them to. So we urged Titus, who encouraged your giving in the first place, to return to you and encourage you to finish the ministry of giving. Since you excel in many ways, in your faith, your gift of speakers, your knowledge, your enthusiasm, your love from us, I want you to excel also in this gracious act of giving. And what he's saying, is, you see those poor people? You see how they gave? Doesn't that make you want to do something? I have been blessed uh, by being around people who are generous givers, and it really encourages me. I, there are people, and I, I'm not going to mention people's names in this church today, but there are people in this church uh, who have served in leadership positions, and some not in leadership positions, who are so generous that when they see, I've seen a guy at an elders meeting when somebody came up with a need, just reaching his, his bill fold and pull out a hundred dollar bill. It wasn't Rodney. It wasn't Rich's either, because there are no hundred dollar bills in there. And, I, I, and when that happened, I thought, I, I want to be that guy. Yeah, I, I want to be the guy. He said, well, you have a need here. Here's, here's a little cash. I've been blessed to see people like that all my life. I was in camp uh, a couple years ago. One of the great things about sending your kids to camp is we have real live missionaries there from the field. We had missionaries two years in a row, one uh, from Taiwan, and the other couple was from Africa. One of them needed $3,300, the other needed $3,200 just to be able to go back to the field where they were taking the gospel. And so uh, they put out the, the challenge, uh, 150 high school kids and about 30 adults, we'd like to raise this week $3,300 to help this, this missionary couple. And as the week went on, they fell in love with the missionary people and their, their work. And I saw one of our kids, one of our high school kids from this church, go to the dean and ask, could I leave camp? We don't let anybody leave camp. Could I leave camp for a little bit? And the dean said, well, what are you doing? He said, I would like to go to the ATM and get some cash. And came back a high school kid with $150. And you know what? When I hear that, I want to give. I, I, I think if a high school kid can do that, that same week of camp, I have a good friend, Nate Schnauz, who passed away this year. One of the most generous people I've ever had the privilege of knowing. And God blessed him with the ability to make money. I think it was good. It was a good arrangement. When Nate was preaching, young, newly married, his wife was a dental hygienist, and they decided, we'll just live on the preaching salary and give away the hygienist money to missions, supported with a tithe at the local church, and then just gave away that salary. I talked to Nate before he died, and he said, you know, for the last 10 years, I've, I've always given 20%. <laughs> he applied at one church. And they offered him a salary. He said, I, I give more than that a week. <laughs> Be hard for me to come, really. And he didn't go. That week of camp, one of Nate's kids wrote a check that week for $1,000 in college. I, you know what? Here's the next suggestion. Do something to teach your kids about God and money. Nate did. Do something to teach your kids about God and money. The Bible says in Ephesians 6, 4, Fathers, don't provoke your children to wrath. By the way, you treat them. Rather, bring them up in the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. And if you're going to teach your kids about God, you have to teach them about money because Jesus talked about money all the time. I don't know how you're going to do that. You, when our kids were little, we put three jars on the, on the dresser. When they got money, there was a jar for God, there was a jar for saving, and a jar for spending. I mean, it's... A, it's a rude awakening for most kids when they <clears throat> get a real job and realize, hey, the government just took half my money or a third of my money. And, and they, kids grew up thinking, well, I got this money. I can spend all this money. That's not the way life works. And you, so teach your kids early. There's, there's, there's a God jar and there's a saving jar and there's a spending jar. Maybe, maybe that would help. And he'd be taught, nobody has the right to say mine except for God. Then he'd be taught to work. Then he'd be taught to be content. 
I really believe in uh, what we do taking our high school kids to Mexico. There's a lot of good reasons for that. Uh, a lot of good reasons to go. One reason is just go see people who live a whole nother way than we live and are happy. And it realize, you realize, you know what? I don't have to have all the things I think that I have to have. How do, you, how do your kids know? How do you teach them about money? More and more people use our text to give, and here's the phone number for you. And I, and I think that's good because people don't write checks anymore. My son Clayton's 25 years old. I don't think he's written a check his whole life. I don't think he's ever written a check. He's getting by. He's got a debit card, and he slides that through, and he can, you can text to give. It's not that hard. You, you type that number on your phone, text, and it'll, it'll run you through the process. I think it's good. I think that's a good thing. But I wonder, how do your kids know you're giving if you text to give? They never see you put any money in the plate. I, I, so how are you going to do it? Put your mouth where your money is. Yeah. <laughs> Tell them what's going on. Well, because yeah, I remember my dad sitting down with me with an old blue ledger book and, and going through. In 1949, we made this much money. We gave this much and we saved this much. Well, how did you do that? <laughs> How is that even possible? I don't know. But he said, that's, that's what we did. And your kids need to be taught about money. And then do something to witness the absurdity of grace. God made the first move in generosity, crazy generosity, 2 Corinthians 8 9. You know how generous the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, though he was rich, for your sakes he became poor, that by his poverty he could make you rich. And grace is completely illogical and crazy. And when you're captured by grace, it changes things. Luke chapter 21. It's a crazy act. While Jesus was in the temple, he watched the rich people dropping their gifts in the collection box. He watched. A poor widow came by, dropped in two small coins. I tell you the truth, Jesus said, this poor widow has given more than all the rest of them. They've given a tiny part of their surplus. She poor she is, has given everything that she has. Another time a lady came and her life saving was wrapped up in a jar of very expensive perfume. And she broke it on Jesus' feet and people began to criticize. And Jesus stopped them. He said, Mark 14, 9, I tell you the truth, wherever the good news is preached throughout the world, this woman's deed will be remembered and discussed. Love causes you to do things that make no sense to other people. It may cause you, when it's time to trade a car and to give the car to somebody who needs it rather than, it's hard. It, it may cause you, instead of taking a family vacation, which I love to do, but instead of taking uh, the group on a mission trip, as one of our families did last year. That may sound crazy, but nothing in the history of the world sounded crazier than the cross of Jesus. When we needed generosity, through his, he laid aside his wealth and became poor, that we, through his poverty, might become rich. It starts with the gracious giving that God did. And somebody said, you can give without loving, but you can't love without giving. Let's pray together. Father, I pray that uh, the words that today, and some of these are hard words to hear. I, I pray for those who've heard them, that you might plow up our hearts and make us tender to your word so we could do what you ask us to do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.